Hello, hello. Checking this on. All right. Sorry for the delay, but uh, I think we're good to get going now. Um, nice to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Pratt. I'm a software engineer at the Pacific Northwest National Lab up in Washington State. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work that we do up there with immersive technologies, with virtual and augmented realities, uh, and a variety of different situations, as well as uh, one of the things that we're actually demoing over in the XR Village this week. So um, please stop by if you want to actually try some of this stuff out. So to start with, I'm just going to go over a little bit about what we do in immersive computing at uh, PNNL. Um, this includes quite a few different things. We are not just specific to one particular project, but we do actually cover the entire gamut of what we do at the lab. Um, I'll go into a little bit about uh, more detail about what we're doing with the, um, the project that we're demoing over here this week. And then I'll also go into some of the um, other XR applications that we've used at the lab, um, we found as effective, uh, able to communicate well to uh, sponsors and partners and the public as well, um, and just maybe some lessons learned. So a little bit about um, immersive computing at PNNL. Um, we've been around for around about eight years now. We started on the first sort of the big push into VR back in like 2016, 2015 time. Um, since that time, we've had to adapt considerably as the technology has changed. We've had to um, sort of adapt as well to the, um, the changing face of what the lab is doing and what their priorities are. Um, so the lab, if anyone's unfamiliar with the national lab system, is we're looking at trying to you know, increase efficiency in the economy for the US government, as well as the people and the public around, around the country as well. Um, and then we also uh, the, the lab itself actually exists primarily um, in, in association with the Hanford site out in eastern Washington. So we do a lot of work with nuclear remediation, nuclear energy, um, but that doesn't stop there. We also go into more renewable energies as well, um, looking at geothermal, looking at wind and tidal power. Uh, we have a whole marine sciences campus out in, um, in western Washington. So we look at marine energy and uh, the impacts that that has on our systems as well. Um, each of those um, areas that I mentioned can benefit from XR technologies in some form or another. So we're, we're on hand to try and make sure that they can envision what they're doing and uh, get something out there that's impactful. What we do, we do a lot of design. We work with sponsors directly to try and actually envision what they're, they're trying to produce. Uh, there's a lot of interaction at the early stages trying, trying to make sure that we are actually getting what the sponsor wants. And that can, that can boil right down to actually the platform that we're trying to use. So um, in certain cases, you know, certain immersive platforms may not be the right tool to use. Um, you know, we, we, people want to create environments and things like that. That sort of favors a more virtual reality aspect. Some people want to bring in digital twins or bring things into their environment themselves. So we have to make sure that we're adaptable and we can, um, we can change with what those those different sponsors may need um, when, when those things arise. Um, we do actually create a lot of content ourselves. Uh, we do a lot of 3D asset development because a lot of the things that systems and things that we're trying to recreate and, and envision um, are very specific and they may not exist out there in the world in general. So we have to be uh, uh, able to create what we can uh, and uh, at a high level as possible. So. Um, and then the last thing is actually to implement those 3D assets into a virtual or augmented or some sort of 3D environment uh, so that we can then explore um, and go and uh, show this to the world. So the different applications that we end up going towards, um, they can be very, quite varied. Uh, we do a lot of training platforms, so taking people into environments that they may not normally go into and be able to do it repeatedly over and over again. So they'd be able to sort of build up those skills before they actually encounter the situation in real life. Um, we also work with scientists as well to try and do scientific visualizations um, as well as situational awareness to visualize data. Um, so data that's inherently three-dimensional lends itself very well to both virtual and augmented reality systems. Uh, we create environments that are able to envision that data and uh, ideally uh, give them new insights into what that data is trying to show. And that has happened quite a few times uh, during this. Um, 
we're not just sponsor facing, we are public facing as well. We do a lot of communication, just uh, not just to the general public, uh, but to uh, academia, to industry, to third parties. Um, and that communication can work really well when you're, when you're doing something with something new and exciting. Um, so taking people to an environment that they may not normally go into, um, this can be a, a quite a novel approach and quite engaging for those folks. We are using the very latest we can ha hardware we can get our hands on. Um, as I said, we started at the very early stages of uh, VR and AR as that sort of became more mainstream. Um, so we started with things like HoloLens 1, with Oculus Rift, um, HTC Vive, when the first one of those came out, we had one too. Um, but now we're starting to progress into much more, uh, more uh, modern systems, more more uh, latest technology that's out there. Uh, things like uh, working with things like VR pass through, we do quite a lot these days. Um, and we have up here also, um, not up here because the presentation's over here. Um, we we have a we we also have a Vario XR3 which we're going to demo today. Uh, but we also have it over in our booth over in the XR Village as well. And that, that equipment is, is sort of latest tech that we can get our hands on. Um, the XR4 came out just after we bought this one, but um, uh, this, this is um, certainly a step up in, in rendering capability they're actually able to achieve, which does have a uh, significant impact with what the sponsors actually want. So that takes us through a little bit about some of the immersive capability background, but I also want to talk about why we're here this week. And that is uh, primarily to demonstrate the, one of the projects that we've been working on, uh, which is the Cellar XR project. So uh, Cellar stands for the Control Environment um, Laboratory Resource, um, and is run in partnership with uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, um, which is a DHS um, agency. Um, and what we're trying to do with this um, project is actually create um, test platforms for that are realistic, that use the same hardware, that use the same software as real systems that exist out in, in the real world. So we can actually test um, different methods of, of uh, finding threats to do red blue teaming or things like that um, and sort of do it in a safe and um, reliable environment. And what the team actually has done is not only created um, the software and on the actual uh, on the in interfaces that we use, but also we've created physical models and scaled down models of these um, systems that we call skids. Um, and those skids are about the size of a tabletop. They contain a good representation of what actually happens in the real world. Um, and then they're completely three-dimensional physical models. In partnership with INL, Idaho National Lab as well, um, we've created a number of these skids in a number of different systems. The ones that we have at p and include things like the rail yard system, uh, the seaport, um, the hydropower plant, uh, and the water systems as well. Um, so these are quite diverse systems. They have quite diverse uh, visualizations associated with them as well. So we have to make sure we build our systems that are able to sort of port between both of each of those skids as, as they go. Um, so I'm just going to show a quick video. I uh, apologize for folks at the back if it's a little bit small, but um, you can see some of these skids um, that we have at PNNL. Um, we have the rail yard skid that sort of scales down an actual um, system that exists in the real world. We invite people, industry partners, academia, uh, sponsors into, into PNNL to actually uh, interact with these skids and try and hack those skids um, to see how they do. But what we can do is then with a with the XR system is take it a step further. We can scale this uh, system so we can take it on the road as we have done this week. Um, and in doing so, we can create a, uh, essentially a virtual twin of these skids. So we have the same sort of interactions that we're doing with the real skids, but now we're just doing it all with a virtual representation of it as well. So these goes uh, all the way to the, to a, the, the, our envisioning for the future is actually to create um, environments as well that um, immerse people in the systems that we're trying to show them. So not only do we see the scale version of those skids, but we can actually take people into, for example, the train cab. Um, so we're scanning essentially people down into the skid itself um, to, to actually interact and play with the train uh, as it exists on the skid itself. Um, 
In order to capture the skid, we do a couple of different ways. We create a virtual model, but we also record in three dimensions as well. So we use a software called DepthKit, and I'll go into this in a sec, to be able to recreate that 3D, 3D uh, representation of the skid in a virtual environment. Um, we can do lots of different things, like create trains to derail and uh, water systems to break and overflow and all that fun stuff that we can't really do in the real world. So, um, as I said, uh, why Seller XR? Why, why are we actually building this platform? Well, we kind of want to scale this. We want to take this on the road. Um, and we're using a bunch of different softwares. We're building most things in Unity, um, so we can port to different platforms. But we can also, we're also making use of this 3D capture software called DepthKit. And this is actually a third-party third software created by a company called Evercoast. Um, and they're able to do real-time 3D capture using up to, um, at the moment, up to 10 different sensors. But I think we're going to get a bit higher than that in the future um, to recreate a 3D model of the scale of what we're actually trying to do. So that's uh, the tabletop scale, which is kind of nice. So at the moment, we've actually created this demo to use on the HoloLens and also on the Vario XR3. In the future, we'll probably take this to the Quest 3 and then any other further headsets that we see being useful in the future, we can definitely do that. So for the depth kit setup itself, we are actually using 10 femto bolts at the moment. Um, these 10 femto bolts are calibrated and organized in a certain geometry around each of these skids and is able to capture to pretty good resolution um, on um, most of the surfaces that we're actually using. Um, we're actually able to capture in real time, so we can get up to 30 to 60 frames per second. Uh, and in certain cases, we're actually able to live stream this. Um, unfortunately, we were hoping to be able to live stream today. Uh, the bandwidth that we're actually able to try and we were able to get to today, unfortunately, wasn't high enough to get a good representation of what we can actually show. But generally speaking, we can get up to 30 frames per second at 4K um, with this stream, which is really kind of nice. A little bit more about the um, the app development is that um, one of the problems that we interacted with is the fact that a lot of these surfaces are reflective or shiny on the skids themselves. So we had to try and find a way to um, interact, uh, try and try and work with DepthKit and, and Evercoast to create um, a way to represent those shiny and reflective surfaces. They were able to create a, sh a shader to be able to uh, project the camera systems onto a surface that we could use the CAD designs for the skids themselves for. Uh, and then in doing so, we're actually able to um, give a pretty good re representation of those skids. And we'll show you that in a second, um, so long as all the technology works. We've been having a few issues this morning. Um, these skids that we're going to show are scale models of the actual skids themselves. But we're actually also able to show sort of more full scale assets associated with that model. So with that, I'm going to hand over to um, I'm just going to switch over the HDMI port, and hopefully this works. Uh, my lovely assistant, uh, Brandon DeGear, is going to be demoing. Uh, he's been helping working on this software uh, quite considerably. So. OK, Dougie. All right, so Brandon, if you, could, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking us through a little bit of what you're seeing. So we have the rail skid up here. Um, this is in uh, what we call exploration mode. Um, so we can actually have a demonstration of these skids in action uh, completely virtually uh, and show off different features of that skid as we go through. So uh, we have a bunch of different interactable objects on there. Uh, we're using everything with hand tracking on this value as well. Um, so we can bring up things like the train cab and actually go, if we, want, if we had space to step into it, we could actually go and step into the train cab as well. Um, there are interactable elements within this too, so you can actually change the speed of the trains within the app itself. Um, and in certain cases, we run scenarios as well that allow us to do things like train derailments and turning um, critical, critical uh, systems on and off um, as we go. So um, that's the... That's a quick overview of the rail skid, but if we go into the wastewater skid now, which is uh, one of the other things that we developed, and we're going to actually use, um, be able to see what we did with depth kit to actually project um, some of the more challenging aspects of doing water systems in uh, using this technology. Um, so here we have uh, a representation of the water skid. 
Uh, so it has essentially three different sections on here. We have the digester on the right hand side, we have the membrane in the middle, and then on the left hand side we have a bar screen. So three different systems that we can go into and explore in more details. Um, there's some virtual assets associated with this as well, uh, but we can actually run through, this is actually a recording that we did on the real skid, and we're actually showing this in three dimensions and in VR right now, so we can run through scenarios over and over again. Uh, in the future, we will be able to live stream this directly from the skid in, in, uh, in Richland, uh, but as, as right now, we can show you this demo uh, as to where, where the sort of qualities and the resolutions that we can actually get out of it right now. So, thanks, Brennan. Appreciate it. Good work. All right. All righty. Sweet. Um, all right, so a few of the next steps. Um, obviously, we've got more platforms to go. We've shown you the, the waste ward and the rail skid right here. We have the seaport skid in, in progress right now. Um, we have a couple of others that we have at PNL that, um, that we want to want to take, take forward, things like the hydropower skid um, as well. So um, lots of things to play with, lots of things to do. Um, point, to, point to the latest uh, technology, things like Quest 3. Um, and any, any future technology uh, headsets that come out soon, uh, we'll be right there um, trying to make use of them as best we can. Um, and then also maybe thinking about ways to integrate more systems into the apps themselves, whether that be through digital twins or virtual desktops. Uh, we can take and view uh, a lot of this stuff within the, the VR app that we're creating, and we just want to be able to extend that and go further and further and further. So a little bit more about some of the other things that we do in Immersive, just to finish off with. Um, and we are, so the way that Immersive community is set up at PNNL is that we are based within the um, AI and data analytics division. So we have a lot of very close partners that work within the AI industries uh, and, and sort of actually developing new software, and new capabilities all the time. Uh, and we were, we're, we're right there with them to sort of make sure we can best use any of their models, any of their technologies. Um, in the XR environment. And we've been doing this for a while, so this is actually a, a video from a project that I did a couple of years ago that's actually doing color detection. We've, we've been thinking about being able to try and port these AI models onto mobile devices for a long time now. Um, so this is actually doing things like chemical detection. Um, and so we can actually see very distinct color, uh, very small color changes that you may not be able to see in the field, um, but we'll actually be able to do that using essentially the webcam on the whole lens. So, that gives you a sense of like the technologies that we were trying to trying to make best use of at the time. Um, AI we see has been incredibly useful for our uh, workflow going forward. Um, that can be in a variety of different ways, whether it be in the development space, so actually creating assets, creating systems faster, uh, creating more prototypes out there that sponsors can give us feedback on to make sure that we're actually doing what we're doing correctly, um, but also Within the applications that we're developing ourselves, we kind of want to make sure we can tune the apps correctly to um, see what the, the trainer's actually doing at that time. So trying to make sure we're sort of iterating on the fly as well, which would be really kind of cool. Um, these headsets are actually creating a lot of data as well. Um, so as we're walking around, it's not just positional data, but eye tracking data, uh, hand tracking data, how we're actually performing within these apps can be analyzed and be understood as to whether or not we're actually, you know, getting good results from these apps, get, getting, um, getting the training scenarios working really well. Um, and we can only improve by trying to explore these technologies and these developments um, going forward. So that's uh, pretty exciting. The sort of environments that we've used um, include really dangerous places too. So we can expose people to things like active shooter scenarios. So we can actually start getting people um, understood as sort of how they would react in these sort of situations. Um, and that, that can be quite an intense, um, uh, intense scenario that we just really, um, you don't really know until you put the headset on someone um, as to how that works out. So. Um, with this situation, we actually had like a 
we, we took people in there and had to deal with like an active shooter situation. So they had to either sort of hide behind a desk or barricade a door. Um, or in some cases, you, you could actually run up behind them and try and take, like fight, essentially. So, you know, we could actually go in there and actually try and do the sort of sit situations and trainings that we, we w want people to understand. Um, we've also taken people into created environments that, you know, train people on best practices, um, getting people that muscle memory before they actually go into the field, whether that be through, um, you know, proper PPE in a chemical situation such as this. Uh, so we actually create the environments as, um, as flexible as possible and as creatively as possible. So in this case, we actually create our own maps within VR. We could actually also do this on desktop too and transmit the actual maps to the, um, to the headset after the fact. So um, with this situation, we actually create a lot of things at the same time, as well as being exposing them to realistic environments, realistic health effects that they happen. So we can use certain issues with, with uh, certain situations with VR that reduce field of view or blurriness or things like that and actually create something that's disorientating for the user. Um, and as I said, we do a lot of things with nuclear waste up in, up in around the, the Hanford site. So we can actually take people into the tanks themselves and show them, show them the sort of um, what 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 they would norm, what they would hope to see if they could actually go into the tanks um, and be able to operate technology and systems down there. Uh, we actually found with this demonstration that we used uh, for another uh, conference that uh, we actually hooked this up to an Xbox controller and they actually control this arm um, within both VR and on a t on a TV screen. We actually found that people used um, the VR with the Xbox controller a lot better than the TV screen. So actually being able to be in the environment, be able to see the arm from lots of different angles. This is an incredibly 3D structure that we're trying to take people into. We could actually operate systems a lot better if we had this points of view, had this uh, understanding of what they're trying to do in a three-dimensional way. So just to finish up, a um, little bit about, um, so yep, we're, we are expanding across the PNL mission space. It's not just in security or cybersecurity, but we are across the lab. Um, although, please come by the booth as well. Um, we're over in the XR Village. Come try out the demo. Um, we have a couple of different applications, both on HoloLens and on Vario. So, do try out both if you can. Um, we're going to be working with AI going on the future. I think everybody can see that happening, and we just need to make sure that we use it the best way we possibly can, um, in the most useful ways. Um, and we're definitely going to be using game engine technology in various different ways. We're, we're right, trying to push that, that, those systems as much as they can uh, in lots of different ways that we maybe haven't thought of yet. So with that, I just want to finish up there. And do we have any time for questions? Or are we one minute for questions? So if anybody's got any questions, then I'll, be, I'll try and answer them. Okay, so the question is about whether or not we can, we've seen any data about improving situational awareness um, using these technologies. Um, so I'd say anecdotally, yes, um, but not anything physically, uh, mostly because a lot of what we do is actually trying to create prototypes to show that this sort of thing is possible. We're trying to get it out there as quickly as possible in a variety of different ways. So um, I'd say, yeah. We've seen improvements, but um, we we'd obviously could just need to do, do more of this stuff in the future. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Uh, have a good rest of your week.